the 1920s. Um, they often get the name the Roaring Twenties, but I want to sort of discuss how that is a misnomer in a lot of ways. Um, it was a prosperous time, um, but not for everybody. Um, the Republican Party was definitely the strongest. Uh, Republicans held the White House throughout the 1920s and returned very much to an era of laissez-faire capitalism and and the sense of nationalism uh, that was brought after the end of World War I for the United States, plus the uh, increasing amount of production that went along with World War I, uh, was met with um, the decrease in demand once European economies recovered. And uh, that overproduction eventually was one of the reasons why the economy declined so much. Um, so, just a few images here that are sort of associated with the 1920s. Um, so we know that the 1920s in a lot of ways was the age of the automobile mass production, mass consumption. Um, it also was an age where social, the social reforms of the progressive era are, are essentially coming to a close, but there still are some important accomplishments. So we discussed a lot of these already because they're sort of um, grouped more with the progressive movement in a lot of ways. But we know that, um, that the prohibition movement uh, sort of uh, accomplished its, its final goal of actually, uh, of actually passing the prohibition amendment towards the end of the 19-teens. Um, another thing that's really significant to realize for the 1920s that, that definitely challenges the notion that it was a roaring period was that there was a lot of social strife. Um, in particular, uh, this can be uh, really epitomized with the revival of the Ku Klux Klan, um, which sort of ceased to have any power after the Reconstruction Acts in 1867. Um, but then after the uh, the First World War, you're going to see that the KKK resurges, and it's it's not only targeting blacks at this point; it's also really becoming like a, a group that is anti anyone who's not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. So, you know, some of the social conflicts that take place in the 1920s show us that by calling it the Roaring Twenties, calling it a prosperous age, is certainly overgeneralizing about the period. Um, but let's just think about some of the ways in which it, it was seen as roaring, so to speak. Um, one of the ways we see that there's a there's definitely a, a very significant increase in the both urban and suburban population. So there's there really is uh, more of an emphasis on um, working for much larger corporations. Um, we do see that there's a shift away from farming in that sense, um, which already was starting during the progressive era, but it continues very much. We're going to see also uh, an increased uh, emphasis on consumption during the 1920s. So consumption just meaning buying things, and oftentimes things that people don't really need. We're going to see that uh, that advertising is going to uh, very effectively sort of create demands for people that are not really based on necessity, but based on desires, anxieties. Um, so it's going to be a, a society that really, they want to go out and see movies. They want to buy the newest fashions. Um, they, they want to really be caught up in the growing Hollywood culture. And, and this sort of proliferation of culture is another reason why we call it roaring. Um, it was also very, uh, uh, a significant cultural development in the sense that you start to see an increasing, um, an increasing sense of, I guess, social freedom among different classes. Women uh, have a much more prominent place in the public. Uh, the flapper culture epitomizes that. And you're also going to see a huge development in music in the 1920s. And, and this also shows us that there is uh, some more interaction between the black and white communities because more and more people start to listen to jazz music, which uh, traditionally was uh, performed by black musicians. And so you will see this interesting intermingling between white and black, but that doesn't mean equality. We will see that even though there are a lot of black musicians that become famous in the 1920s, they're still sort of exploited by... Um, by white record producers and performance agents and such. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of um, an increased appreciation for black culture, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's equality. All right, so moving on. So again, we talk about how it was an age of prosperity. There are a number of reasons why that is. Um, one of which is just in the sense that the economy um, was expanding rapidly. Um, this is uh, very evident in the sense that there is a, an increased production <clears throat> that exists. Um, and uh, this also, of course, is going to lead to increased consumption. If people are producing more, pe there have to be 
there has to be a market to actually buy things. So we'll see that things start to be produced in massive quantities thanks to the age of the factories, and also in particular thanks to the age of the assembly line, which is uh, really perfected by Henry Ford and his automotive industry. So we'll see that all of these things uh, are uh, really changing the way that things are produced and also the way that people buy things. Of course, with mass production, it also decreases the prices of goods, so that's also going to make things uh, much more affordable. Um, and of course, the focus on advertising also means more and more people think that they want something even if they don't. And my apologies, this got cut off by this picture, but this last point, um, and it's purposely separated from the others, one point that we tend to ignore. It's not truly an age of prosperity because we also have an ailing agricultural sector that says ailing agriculture um, that is in a lot of ways sort of... Um, foreshadowing what's going to happen during the Great Depression. So we did have warnings, we just sort of chose to ignore them and focus on the good things. Um, okay, so in terms of economic expansion and mass production, um, both during and after World War I, we see a huge increase in industrial production, and uh, this doesn't necessarily expand the workforce, it just expands how much people are producing. And so one of the ways that we're able to produce so much more, and we'll talk about this more in the next slide too, is through assembly line production. So think of an assembly line as essentially um, uh, a way to basically simplify the production of any, um, any manufactured good. The idea behind an assembly line is that each person on the line basically does one little part of the process, and it doesn't really require skill. Um, I almost think of like a conveyor belt where each person standing on the belt just puts one little piece onto whatever the product is. So this means that whoever's working on the assembly line doesn't need very much experience. They can easily be replaced, and uh, since they move in an efficient manner, this also means that you can actually... Uh, produce much more without actually hiring more people. You don't need that skilled work, worker force that actually has to have the training and has to make everything by hand. Um, automated machinery also is going to make things be produced much more easily and with um, and without actually increasing the number of people that you have to employ. And of course, if you are replacing people with machines, that's going to save money for corporations. Um, another thing that you start to see happen is that there is... Um, a growing emphasis on trying to maintain a workforce. Um, so you are going to see the introduction of a concept called welfare capitalism, which is essentially this effort to improve the worker morale and also sort of challenge uh, the need to have unions. Because if companies essentially provide fair working conditions for their laborers, there's no need for them to join a union. And so with welfare capitalism, essentially what we see happening is um, jobs are increasingly providing better benefits uh, for their employees. Um, businesses are sort of uh, promoting, um, promoting people to get all of the, um, get all the benefits uh, that they would get through unions directly from their employer. And so it does appear on the outset that, um, that businesses are treating their laborers better, but at the same time, by not joining a union, they're, they're, that may ultimately um, contribute to a decline in, in worker conditions, right? If, if ultimately there is a, ultimately there is a problem in, in, uh, in a corporation where they can no longer provide uh, provide these kind of services that, that uh, fall under the umbrella of welfare capitalism. So with welfare capitalism, think about basic, you know, um, think about pension plans, right? Think about essential promises that you get from your, from your bosses that make you want to stay at a job, right? Like we want to stay in our jobs for a long time if we have good health benefits, for example. So, you know, what, but when employers provide these additional incentives, you might be less likely to unionize, but ultimately those incentives are not guaranteed, right? And if the economy takes a downturn, you could lose those. And if you had union membership, you might be a little bit safer. So welfare capitalism was sort of, um, it was sort of an artificial safety net for some workers because when the economy did decline, ultimately you aren't going to see those kind of uh, job benefits actually continue. So in the Great Depression, a lot of these things are going to go away. Um, you're also going to see, in general, um, corporations are going to still own a huge amount of, of uh, one type of business, right? So you are going to see um, the continuation of what we call oligopolies, not quite monopolies, right? But it basically, an oligopoly means that corporate ownership is centered among just a few companies. So monopoly would just be one, an oligopoly just means a few, right? Um, so the way that oligopolies develop is that they figure out ways to... Um, sell a diverse array of products, right? So they're not just producing one thing. They can be sort of a one-stop shop. They integrate production and uh, distribution. And they also conduct a lot of uh, research to try to figure out 
what types of products consumers want to buy. So ultimately, they have a way to buy and sell ultimately everything that a person needs so they don't have to go anywhere else. The A&P, which is now just a supermarket chain, it's a pretty small one, but the A&P was sort of a really good example of this oligopoly. Uh, essentially, you could go to an A&P and buy virtually anything that you needed. Um, so again, that one-stop shop kind of, um, kind of mentality. So those develop. Again, the 1920s we can see is the age of the automobile, right? Um, and this also, I see this as a really good example of how the assembly line was so effective. Um, the automobile really was sort of the symbol of the rise of the consumer economy. By the time you got to the 1920s, cars were much more affordable and in much higher demand. Um, by 1925, production, because of the assembly line, was so efficient that at uh, there was one uh, Ford factory, it was in Highland Park, and it completed a car every 10 seconds, right? So just thinking about the ways in which um, assembly lines are able to churn out those products. And also if they can produce them in such mass quantities, they can, be, they can sell them for a relatively cheap price, meaning more and more people can buy them, right? Um, and also there's just this general sense that more and more people need them since everybody has one, right? It's like an iPhone. Everyone has one around you, so you feel like you need to have one even though there isn't really a necessity. Um, so in the 1920s, the U.S. made about 85% of all the world's autos, so it definitely had a clear control over the automotive market. Of course, they were selling to foreign buyers as well. Um, and also, one of the other things that the Ford company did quite well, which was characteristic of the age, was they tried to make working conditions very favorable to their laborers to try to reduce turnover, to try to make sure that they... Um, that they kept a very loyal labor force. Um, so they actually paid uh, the factory workers at Ford higher than the going rate. Um, so this basically meant that people wouldn't quit as easily. Um, and also they were paid enough so that they could afford to actually buy the products that they were producing, right? So people who worked in Ford factories oftentimes would be paid enough so that they could go and buy a car from Ford, right? So being both a producer and a consumer was really significant. And also, of course, it, again, is going to very much increase loyalty among the workforce, right? They, they really feel like they can stand behind their company because they pay them fair enough wages that they can actually buy the product that they're working on. Um, but that doesn't just extend to the uh, workers in these Ford factories. <clears throat> You're going to have, in general, uh, the automobile um, production is, is happening in a way that more and more Americans uh, are able to buy a car, right? So uh, just a couple of figures, right? Um, in around 1920, the Ford Model T, which was one of the most popular um, early Ford models, sold for about $300. And this is like the basic Ford Model T. So like there was no, there were no bells and whistles. There were no um, extra features in the car, but $300. If we adjust that for inflation, that's $3,553 today. So that may seem like a lot of money for people who don't drive. But nowadays, if you want to buy a new car, you want to buy like a Honda Civic or something, okay, you're going to be paying like 20 grand. So the price still, if you think about the current price of new cars, new basic cars, is still very affordable, right? Um, it still would be maybe about three months wages, okay? But still, um, you know, uh, if you want to buy a brand new car now, you're probably looking at, if you're lucky, a half a year's wage, maybe way more than that, depending on what your income is. And also things like cost of living, cost of education have all gone up. So basically, it's much more difficult for you to afford a car with just three months wages uh, these days and age. Um, another thing that they do is they try to diversify the types of cars that they're producing so that they feel like there's something for everybody, right? So just like today, we have SUVs, we have convertibles, we have, you know, station wagons, we have um, whatever, we have reg regular sedans. Um, Fords also diversified their, their auto lines um, and, you know, trucks, all these things. So I showed this adver advertisement down here to show you how many different types of cars uh, and automobiles that they were selling. Um, so essentially by trying to um, do a lot of research, figure out what the consumer wanted, um, they felt like they could provide something for everybody, which increased sales. And of course, it, it made more and more people feel like they needed a car. And even though Ford was sort of the champion of this, um, obviously, other automotive industries started to copy this model. And as we know today, obviously, pretty much every brand of car that you purchase um, you're going to have all these different models to choose from, right? Like, so if you buy a Nissan, you can buy a regular sedan, you can buy an SUV, you can buy a truck, you get the idea, right? So that, you know, you can go to Ford and buy pretty much any kind of car that you want. Um, 
another thing that the automotive industry does is it, uh, the demand that it, uh, that it produces is going to stimulate other industries. So the steel industry is is going to very much benefit from massive auto production. Um, the rubber industry also for the interior, glass industry, and the petroleum industry. And so uh, before the early 20th century, you didn't see a huge demand for petroleum, but obviously once cars are in huge demand, this is, um, this is gonna be a very crucial product. And of course, uh, for synthesis sake, this is a huge continuity to today. Think about how significant uh, the oil supply is for virtually any industrialized country to the point where we have seen military conflict over oil supplies, right? Um, another thing that we see is, of course, as autos are produced in uh, larger quantities, roads are going to be built. Um, all over the place. They're going to try to, on the one hand, make it easier for people to get in and out of cities. So we're going to see more highways get built, um, which is going to allow people to move to the suburbs and still work in the cities. So suburbanization will be sort of a 1920s uh, phenomenon, but it also, for synthesis again, it will come back in the 1950s after World War II. You're going to have a lot of people move to the suburbs as well. Um, but, you know, in a lot of ways, this is sort of a foreshadowing to the post-World War II world. You're also just going to see that cities are going to grow pretty rapidly. Um, so, you know, in addition to having urbanization, you do have suburbanization. And what's interesting is that the newer cities that are developing, so this is an aerial shot of Houston, Texas, and obviously this is a more modern Houston. It wouldn't have looked like this in the 1920s. But what I want you to pay attention to are the, is the pretty extensive highway network right down here. Because what you see is a lot of the, what we call sunbelt cities. These are cities that started to, well, most of them are in the west and south. Um, so that's one of the reasons why they're called Sunbelt. They're newer cities, right? So like Los Angeles is another example of a Sunbelt city. Most cities in Texas are all considered Sunbelt cities. We're considered, we could call it ourselves up in Connecticut, we could say that we're more of a uh, snow belt or rust belt area. There's more, um, there's more flight, um, like we don't really maintain a a significant wor uh, working age population in Connecticut as we do in other parts of the country. Uh, cost of living is higher. So anyway, um, so the Sunbelt cities start to grow increasingly. Houston is an excellent example because Houston had a huge oil refining industry. So it grows up very quickly. And I also wrote that it grows horizontally. And what I mean by that is these cities grow out instead of up, right? So think about New York City. Part of it is because it's on an island, right? But New York essentially grows upward, right? Buildings keep getting taller and there's a limited amount of space as far as zoning is concerned and geography is concerned. A city like Houston did not have those sort of geographical restrictions. And so you see a lot of these Sunbelt cities just grow outward to the point where there are these huge metropolises that, I mean, you get to the point where people will commute for over an hour in each direction just to get into these cities that grow outward. San Francisco is an excellent example of, of, of that as well because the Bay Area is so large that you have people commuting from places like Sacramento all the way into the Silicon Valley. So these places just grow out a ridiculous amount. Again, one of the misnomers about the Roaring Twenties, uh, I mean, really, we can't call it Roaring because not everyone was doing as well as we'd like to think that they were. Farmers are already feeling the pinch in the 1920s that doesn't catch up with the rest of the economy until the, until the 1929 market crashed. Um, so what we really see is that the golden age of agriculture, when, when production was high, prices were high, um, and conditions were good for workers, was during World War I itself. And then what we see is after the war, there's going to be a pretty steady decline in agricultural profits. Um, so one of the reasons why that is, is because uh, during the war, we were providing most of the food demands for Western Europe because trench warfare was essentially destroying all of their agricultural land and we were acting as their breadbasket. After the war was over though, of course, the European economy was able to recover. Once they start producing agriculture like they did before the war, the demand for American products is no longer going to be there. And farmers don't catch on with that declining demand right away, and so they keep producing at wartime levels. And this is going to create a huge surplus of agricultural material. And this is gonna mean that prices are gonna plummet, right? So essentially, farmers don't have market, they don't have buyers for all of their products. Sometimes their products are going to go to waste. Um, 
And one thing that they can't keep up on is the expensive uh, costs of farming. One of the most expensive things that farmers had to do is pay their mortgage, right? And if they are not taking in enough of an income because their uh, the prices of their products has declined and uh, they are producing a surplus and can't sell it, they're unable to pay their mortgages. And so we're going to see that mortgage foreclosure rates are going to skyrocket in the 1920s. And I'm not sure why, but this map like didn't have, uh, this chart didn't really have a background. So it's hard to see that well, but um, this this is just a 10 year period. So you can see like, this is 1920, this is 1930. And you just see the precipitous rise of foreclosure rates throughout the decade, right? Um, what else, what else, what else, what else? Um, in terms of agriculture, we're going to see there was an attempt by Congress to um, to help aid the failing um, agricultural industry. Um, Congress in the 1920s attempts to pass uh, the McNary Howgen Bill, and what that would have done was regulate farm prices, right? Because that was one of the reasons the decline of prices is is one of the reasons why farmers were struggling so much. But there is an opposition to this because essentially it would it would cost a lot of money. Essentially, the tax dollars would be sort of artificially uh, elevating the prices of farm goods when they didn't necessarily have to be that high. And so there um, there was enough opposition to the McNary, McNary Howgen Bill that despite the fact that Congress passed it, um, Calvin Coolidge vetoed it twice, so it never came to be. So basically what we have happen is in the 1920s, there's little to no government support for struggling farmers, right? They, they essentially are taking the approach that farmers need to be subject to the laissez-faire economy just like everybody else does. So we keep seeing farmers lose their property because their mortgages are being foreclosed upon, and, um, and this is going to reach a really critical point once we get into the Great Depression era when there's also an environmental disaster that essentially ruins uh, farming for very small individual farmers. Okay, so moving on, um, there are other industries that decline as well, so it's not just farming. Um, the coal industry is is going to suffer in the 1920s. Some of that is because the automobile industry is going to create a greater demand for oil, and also there's going to be a greater demand for natural gas um, to substitute coal for uh, heating and energy purposes, right? So uh, basically coal miners, in, uh, in especially in Appalachia, are going to find themselves uh, either out of the job or they're going to find themselves earning lower wages. Um, so they're either faced with um, unemployment or the possibility of migrating somewhere else to seek out work. So you will see some problems in more rural areas where coal mining um, was a way of life for people. You also, and this is a really significant development in terms of transportation, the railroad industry is going to start to suffer. And think about how significant the railroad industry was in the late 19th century. But they too can't keep up because um, the automobile industry is going to sort of eliminate the need to have so many trains. And so eventually what we're going to see happening is that uh, train routes, train lines are going to start to disappear. They're going to be replaced by highways. But in a lot of ways, we can see, again, synthesis is all over the place in this unit, um, that this is coming back to hurt us now because there is, uh, we're such an automobile-centered society today that it's very difficult for us to actually rely upon mass transit and the federal government doesn't spend enough money on mass transit. So we find ourselves having to drive places because it's either too expensive or not practical enough for us to take trains, right? And uh, we see that we're lagging behind a lot of other countries like European countries and even countries in Asia that have very efficient train networks. So that's one of the negative effects of the 1920s. Since we became basically the, the country of the car, um, we still are that way. Right? And that's very problematic. Um, another industry that suffers is the textile industry, but only specifically in New England. We will see that in the South, actually, there's going to be a growth in textile production, partly because it was cheaper. Cost of living was cheaper down there and sort of left over from the Reconstruction era. You do have some more industrialization in the South. And, you know, it was cheaper for you to just produce things close to where the natural resource came from. So you were going to you do start to have textile factories that are coming up in the South. So cotton is produced there and whatever the final product is, is pr produced there. Right. You don't now you don't have to ship cotton to some textile fact factory way up in New England to turn it into a finished product. Right. And another reason um, why the textile industry was suffering was chiefly because the current fashions didn't require as much material. So this is sort of a traditional uh, uh, traditional woman's outfit in the 1920s. You can tell that this is one of the first times where women are wearing 
uh, clothing that requires much less material. They are wearing short sleeves. They are wearing higher skirts, right? And uh, this is very different from the sort of full length and very heavy clothing that we saw in the early 20th century and in the 19th century. So basically, since you don't wear as much uh, material, then these textile industries are not going to make as much money, right? Simple as that. Okay, uh, so we're going to finish up by talking about some, some of the cultural changes in the 1920s, and then the next videos I will make later this week. Okay, so the 1920s is one of the re other reasons why we can certainly call it roaring is because this is a very um, rich period in terms of culture. Remember that the U.S. does very well in World War I, so there is this sense of nationalism that is really raging in the U.S., where Europe is experiencing the age of anxiety and it's it's really wondering what's what's going to happen next. So so Europe is sort of suffering culturally, whereas the United States is is doing quite well. Um, the Hollywood film culture is one of the best examples of of um, of how culture is changing, developing, and becoming more uh, in much higher demand for the general public in the 1920s. So one of the things you see is that movie tickets are going to um, movie tickets are going to sell rapidly. They're still very affordable at this point. Um, movie theaters in the 19 teens and 1920s were called Nickelodeons. I don't know if that TV channel even exists anymore, but um, Nickelodeon essentially meant that it cost a nickel to go see a movie, which is very cheap, right? So it was a very easy pastime for people to just go and, and watch a movie, right? Um, you're going to see that the Hollywood industry is going to grow pretty rapidly in the 1920s. Um, by the end of the decade, there were 20 different Hollywood film studios in, uh, in Southern California. Um, and there's also just going to be this general uh, fascination with Hollywood culture, just like honestly there still is now, right? Um, so publicists are really going to create movie stars into these really elegant, almost like superhuman um, characters that... Uh, regular Americans are sort of obsessed with, right? And and this we'll talk about later how in addition to just people wanting to go to the movies more, they're also just really they won't they can't get enough of 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 the celebrity culture, right? So like there's this general sense that these people are sort of beyond perfect, right? And um and Americans very much want to not only see their movies, but read magazine articles about them, dress like them, right? And so the the sort of Hollywood film culture also is in a lot of ways going to increase other patterns of consumption for Americans. They're not just watching the movies, they want to they want to dress the way that movie stars do. They want to use the products that they use, you know. So like all of that stuff is is certainly changing uh, the way that people are spending their money. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of movie companies were founded by Eastern Europeans and so you do see this interesting relationship that continues between Europe and the United States um, just in the sense that um, if uh, if European uh, companies or if Europeans were actually sort of influencing um, the Hollywood industry, um, this had an impact on sort of developing the American commercial tastes, right? Um, you will see that there's a conservative backlash against Hollywood culture. So you know a lot of people feel like it's too sexual, like it's um, like it's blasphemous. Uh, there is a sense of secularization in some of these films. Um, we will see also that there's a, there is sort of like a moral crisis, not crisis per se, but you will see like a, a much more blatant um, expression of sexuality uh, between men and women in the 1920s. So you do see a backlash among conservatives. And uh, this is Will Hayes, who was appointed as what was called the morals czar um, in, the, in the federal government. And basically what he did was he created a... Uh, a code. It was called the Hayes Code. And basically this turns into a production code, which is essentially serving as a censorship organization to explain what to put in movies and what not to put in movies, right? So this is before movies were rated. So instead, basically, this um, production code administration would go and review the material in movies before that you before they would be approved and be able to be shown on the big screen, right? So, um, so we see that there's definitely this effort to try to prevent the general public from consuming something that might be seen as too racy, um, too sexual, too, uh, too immoral. And uh, so we do see that there is definitely that continued conservatism in some ways.
The radio also develops uh, significantly throughout the 1920s. It's important for us to realize that the radio in, during the 19-teens was really seen as a military technology. Um, it was a very efficient means of communication, but since the radio uh, was developed fairly rapidly during the war, uh, there was it essentially adapted in terms of its function to serve more as something for consumers, right? So the radio really just developed from that small growing industry uh, of interest to the military, um, but then we're going to see that um, that it serves an entertainment purpose after the war's over. So um, they're going to be these uh, large companies that start to form their own national radio networks, and they start to air a variety of, of programs to homes across the country. So basically radio was... Uh, what TV is to us today, right? People would tune in at certain times and hear their favorite programs, right? So, I mean, you'd have to use your imagination because you couldn't see anything, but ultimately people got hooked on radio shows the way that people get hooked on Netflix these days, right? Um, we do see that there's still obviously some some room for social progress in the sense that the uh, this should have said first hit radio show rather, and um, the first hit radio sh show that came out in the United States was uh, Amos and Andy, um, which was um, <clears throat> a, a team of men who often did uh, did shows, uh, and it wasn't just radio, by the way. They, they did have radio personalities, but they would perform as well. Um, and oftentimes they would perform in blackface, which we see here. So essentially they don black makeup and, and, and act as though they were black men and, and oftentimes very much mock and ridicule um, black society. So there's certainly, we can see that like socially there was room for improvement in terms of what people were consuming on a popular basis. Um, we also see that as the radio develops, um, there's going to be um, other increased avenues for consumption. More and more people start to listen to music as a form of entertainment. And in addition to listening to it on the radio, eventually people can, of course, buy tickets to attend concerts and uh, buy, buy records and albums. And so this is another way for people to spend money. And then lastly, another great example of growing commercialization, which was improved by the radio, was that more and more people become interested in sports. And sports in the 1920s, baseball in particular, become a huge part of the national pastime. Okay, um, newspapers are also going to become increasingly important in the 1920s, but not all of them serve an actual news purpose, right? We're actually thinking more about um, sort of the garbage newspapers that you see when you're in line to buy your groceries, right? So we're thinking about the tabloids. Um, so uh, tabloid newspapers, uh, you can think of as the very sensationalist papers that are emphasizing things like crime, sex scandals, celebrity gossip, and, and uh, sometimes sports, um, although sports does have a place in the national regular news as well. Um, so basically, you know, you have people um, consuming things that really aren't educating them per se. It's, it's another form of entertainment, right? Um, and of course, this is proliferated by the fact that the Hollywood culture is growing. More and more people want to know what the celebrities are doing. Um, the popularity of tabloids is going to make advertisers start to feel like they need to appeal directly to the working class and immigrant readers. So you are going to see that they're going to sort of target their base towards, um, towards a group of people that they think will consume the most newspapers. Um, and we're going to see, just like a lot of other industries, journalism becomes consolidated so that you essentially have just a handful of companies that are controlling the entire industry. So it's yet another example of an oligopoly in the newspaper industry. So a good example of that, you may remember, because we talked about him in, in uh, our yellow journalism discussion in imperialism, William Randolph Hearst chain of newspapers is a very good example of how in the newspaper industry you could also have an oligopoly. Okay, um, another thing, of course, that is getting more and more people to go out and buy things is that the advertising industry is growing, right? And so basically, um, what is the purpose of advertising? It's to try to convince people that they need to buy things, particularly things that they don't actually need, right? And so in addition to just advertising, what we have, one of the huge parts of advertising is uh, that there needs to be more research, right? So you actually have people that start to be employed as researchers um, to kind of look into consumer needs, emotions, desires, and anxieties. They're not even emphasizing the quality of the product as much as like how they can convince people to buy it, right? Um, they also try to stress consumption as a positive good, like basically buy this because it's a good thing or buy this because your wife will like it, right? It's, it's not buy this because you need it. It's not buy this because you'll die if you don't have it. 
Um, a lot of times they'll make the argument that something that you have is out of date, even if it works perfectly well. And uh, in a lot of ways, this has, again, there, I see this as synthesis to today because we do see that we still are a very significant consumer culture. A lot of things, a lot of times we will get rid of things that are perfectly good. They're just simply outdated, right? Like think about when your phone is eligible for an upgrade. You just trash the old one and get a new one, right? But this certainly is um, producing a culture of waste to a certain extent. Another thing that starts to happen uh, in this time period is that we start to develop new ways to buy things, new ways to pay for things, which allow people to buy things that cost a lot more, right? So uh, prior to this period, most of the time, if you wanted to purchase something, like if you wanted to buy a car, right, or a, a major appliance, you had to pay for the whole thing at once, right, in cash. Um, this is increasingly difficult as things become more expensive, right? And a car is a perfect example of that. Okay, nowadays, most of the time when you buy a car, you put a down payment down, and then you pay off the rest of your car um, on a month-to-month -month basis, right? So this allows you to buy like a $19,000 car and pay it off over a period of a few years, right? And so basically in the 1920s, this was a very new thing that was happening where now, even if something was very expensive in total, you could only pay a little bit each month, and then you could own it outright. Right, so this is definitely a way that um, encouraged more and more people, um, even people who didn't make as much money, to start buying things. Um, but of course, um, this form of consumerism also sometimes would get people into trouble because they may feel as though they can afford things, but then ultimately maybe overextend themselves in how many things they try to purchase on credit. And of course, if you are taking out credit for something and then you lose your cash flow, right? Like you lose your job, for example, then you're still, you still owe the money for it, even if you are no longer able to pay for it. Okay. Another thing that is, uh, exemplifying the, the increase in culture and the increase in consumerism is the music industry. Um, we do have, uh, of course, because the radio, uh, was popular after the war was over, you're going to have an increase in American consumption in popular forms of music. Um, to a certain extent, this is fueled by the dance craze of the 1920s. You have lots of popular dances that people want to learn and ultimately uh, perform when they're, when they're out. Um, the Charleston, the Foxtrot, the Tango, the Waltz, these are all good examples of popular 1920s dancing. This is, uh, this is women doing the Charleston here in the lower left corner. Um, you also, one of the interesting things is, uh, that you do see a little bit more, uh, of a racial integration in terms of musical culture. You are going to see some African-American artists actually become famous, um, during the 1920s, particularly because there's a growing increase in the popularity of jazz music in the 1920s. And so there are two women, um, that were seen as, uh, respectively the mother of the blues. This is Ma Rainey. You can see her here performing with, uh, Louis Armstrong in a band. And then this is Bessie Smith, who was given the nickname the Empress of the Blues. And so both of these women uh, become famous and, and many white people listen to their music. But on the other hand, there are a couple of reasons why we can't think of this as absolute equality for black art artists, right? On the one hand, um, their music was sold on an, as an entirely different genre. A lot of times it was called race music, right? So like their music never became mainstream. Like if there was a popular chart, they would never make number one on the absolute popular chart, right? It was like a totally separate um, category, right? And then also a lot of times these artists would not really generate most of the profit that, they're, um, that they should have gotten for their performances, right? So a lot of times um, these black performers would be managed by white um, record label producers, um, white managers who would be in control of their gigs when they had musical performances. And so a lot of times they ended up sort of uh, getting exploited um, by the white people in the music industry. And again, you could think about continuity and change, right? To what extent do we still see um, sort of uh, a phenomenon that I like to call black exploitation, right? You know, essentially, um, producing music um, or any other type of, of art um, among a black community that is, um, that is widely consumed by whites, but is not really a, a necessarily appreciated for its blackness. It is something that sort of becomes whitewashed. I think about the popularity of Beyonce, for example, and how suddenly when she made that um, Super Bowl performance, there was a sort of backlash by the white community because she wasn't producing something that was accessible to them. But in any case, synthesis for you there. Okay. Another thing that gets really popular in the 1920s um, is sports, right? So um, 
Um, spectator sports, uh, the really the, the epitome of spectator sports in the 1920s was baseball. And uh, it's important for us to realize that baseball already was around um, beforehand, but it wasn't nearly as popular, um, partly due to the fact that it wasn't as widely broadcast. You don't have people uh, using radios, um, at least not in their private homes during World War One, so they couldn't really follow the games unless they were able to attend them. Um, but after everybody owns a radio, everybody can listen to the game, right? And also, you do have some uh, you do have a, some scandals in the 19 teens that sort of tarnish the reputation of baseball. And the best example of that was in 1919. There was a scandal called the Black Sox scandal, and and this was uh, where the um, Chicago White Sox um, they were in the World Series against the Cincinnati Reds, and um, members of the White Sox actually uh, got together with gamblers and purposely lost the World Series, and the gamblers paid them for it, right? So basically they rigged the World Series, and then these members of the White Sox um, made some money by purposely losing the game, right? But then everybody found out about it. Uh, the, the members of the White Sox that were caught ended up being banned for baseball for life. So a lot of people sort of had a sour taste in their mouth when they thought about baseball. Um, but what happens is you have these new characters that sort of bring back the love of baseball, and, and the best one um, is Babe Ruth, his home run hitting and his general appetite for the public eye really makes people um, fall in love with baseball again. Um, and like I said earlier, this broad in radio coverage is going to be another way that that uh, more and more people get interested in the sport. Um, attendance in baseball games is going to soar. Um, newspapers also cover sports games, of course. Um, and one of the things that's important for us to realize is that this progress is limited in terms of racial development. Um, in the sense that uh, the major league was all white and uh, there was a creation of a Negro National Baseball League in 1920, um, which served to, of course, give um, black men a place to play sports and it gave the black community a place to um, consume baseball, you know, um, just by watching black athletes. But ultimately, um, we do see finally in, um, in the post-World War II era, um, baseball will be integrated uh, for the first time when Jackie Robinson is uh, joins the major league. But in any case, uh, you know, we see that there are limits to the, the, the development. Okay, the last slide. One of the more, um, I guess, controversial elements of the 1920s is um, how this affects sort of the status of women and, and um, what their posi position in the public is, right? We do know, of course, that during the Progressive Era and World War I, um, women started to take on more of a public role, and they very much wanted to hold on to that, right? Women start to emerge and work in more industrial jobs, for example. Um, we know that women became successful in terms of fighting for the vote. Um, they successfully achieved prohibition. And so now women are sort of challenging um, the public perceptions of them a little bit more by doing things that were considered more male type behaviors. So they were doing things like smoking cigarettes, they were drinking, and remember that this is during prohibition, so they're drinking bootleg liquor. Um, they're becoming sexually active before marriage, right? Um, they're dancing to jazz music, right? So I mean, ultimately there's this, basically the, the flapper is, um, is symbolic of, uh, of the changing moral status of women in the 1920s. Uh, so this was sort of a revolutionary, um, revolutionary time for women when they when they very much felt like they no longer had to sort of confine themselves to that traditional maternal role. They didn't necessarily have to marry or if they did marry, um, they could sort of live first and 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 have a have a social life, do things that con uh, previously seemed to be reserved only to men. So so conduct social activities that that were more masculine seeming, right? Um, you do see that um, there is going to be an embrace of this culture among some communities. So like they're going to be acclaimed authors who really like to write about the increased openness of sexuality. Um, and so to a certain extent, like the literary and film and music culture does kind of encourage this changing moral uh, compass of women. Um, you do see, but this is limited, uh, there is going to be a little bit of a growing um, homosexual subculture, but this is still very much prone to mainstream criticism and prejudice. You really don't see a huge gay rights movement emerge. Um, to a certain extent, you have a little bit of it emerge after World War II, um, but it becomes much more prominent in the 1970s and 80s. Um, you do also see, of course, advertisers and movie stars sort of using this growing sexuality to promote mass consumerism. Sex sells, as they say, right? Um, 
And uh, general surveys that were studied uh, show that more and more women were having sexual relations before marriage. Um, and uh, what we see is that this is sort of embraced by popular culture. People are very interested in this sort of growing liberation of women. But of course, again, there will be sort of a conservative backlash to it. And so we already saw that with, um, with Will Hayes becoming the moral czar of the Hollywood film industry. So just because there is this development um, among females in terms of popular culture, there is a more mainstream approach that sees this as, as not very appropriate for women. So in any case, this is the beginning of the 1920s. We will continue by talking about um, some more political policies of the 1920s in the future videos.